So I want to talk about some of the almost the geometry considerations when you are dealing with the vectors. And we'll, we'll start out with the 2D. Um, so, you know, in Physics 4A, one thing I say is that a lot of the things you do in mechanics can be done in 2D. You just uh, pick the plane in which interesting things happen and all your descriptions are 2D. In Physics 4B, it's not really that way anymore. So when we are drawing electric field lines, then uh, we might choose to draw it in a 2D way because most of the things we choose to draw things on are appear 2D. But um, when we are actually working our formulas and do like a Gauss's law based derivation that you will see next week, you will see that we actually jump right into 3D. We don't really linger in 2D. Um, so even so, uh, 2D is a good place to start to kind of introduce some of the ways that we deal with the things. So. Um, so coordinate systems and vectors, I think it's a good to kind of start out with the definition of a coordinate axis. It's a, a very uh, unphysicist like of me to start with that because we physicists um, really prefer to work with the vectors before this, uh, defining any coordinate axis. And, uh, but because um, um, uh, some of the descriptions and calculations become easier when you have introduced the coordinate system. So let me say, I've introduced the coordinate system. Now I'm going to use this coordinate system to, for example, uh, describe a vector that looks like this. Um, it could be an actual uh, vector representing position. That would be one. But actually, it doesn't have to be a vector representing position. So, you know, this might have a length of two meters, for example, for position. But you can also be talking about a vector that's on electric field. And that would have a geometric representation. And that would have a magnitude of the vector that's a consistent with the unit of um, electric field, which this week we are using, like, so this could be 100 Newton per coulomb. That would be an electric field vector. Um, so for the rest of this uh, mini lecture, we'll just say a vector is a mathematical object with a magnitude and direction. And what's important is that they have magnitude, length, and uh, direction. There's some kind of angle you can use to describe it. And same deal here. It has some magnitude, some length, and it has some direction that you can use to describe where it's pointing. It's like an arrow. Um, so when we are describing vectors with uh, coordinate systems, so the most uh, natural kind of um, uh, easy one that people are familiar with is the Cartesian system, which uh, uses the, the axis that I just uh, drew. So to um, describe this point um, or this uh, vector, I'm going to use them synonymously, um, to describe it in Cartesian coordinates, you would give it people its coordinates. You know, it's an x coordinate and y coordinate. And that will be your description. And gra um, visually, you can illustrate that as, uh, right, this is its x component. So however much that is, that's x. And this is its y component. However much that is, that's y. You've seen all that. And um, so Cartesian coordinates, it's, um, it's nice. Uh, it's uh, easy to grasp right away. And um, if uh, with the understanding of something like a Pythagorean theorem, uh, if you have this coordinate, you can describe the magnitude of the vector. You know, a hypotenuse there is the square root of the squares, the sum of the squares of the two legs. Um, it's very, um, uh, it's useful. But uh, especially as you will see in situation that we, that we use, Cartesian representation sometimes um, leads to really complicated way of describing. Uh, and a good example is Coulomb's law. So uh, Coulomb's law, if you have, let's say, charge Q1 here and another charge Q2 here, um, using, <laughs> using, using Cartesian representation, this is how your Coulomb's law uh, would appear. So for the magnitude of the forces, the electric force is the Coulomb constant times the product of the charges divided by the distance between them. Let me use D squared. Um, yeah, that would be the magnitude. And to describe the direction, uh, so to describe the full vector quantity with the magnitude and direction, you have to, um, 
one, <laughs> you have to uh, get this distance. That's going to be this quantity here, square root of x squared plus y squared. And um, this vector that you have at that point, you have to break it into x and y components um, using uh, something that we'll talk in at more depth pretty shortly. So you, with all that, the description, the vector description of that electric field in the Cartesian representation, where I write down the x component, and the y component separately, it's going to look like the magnitude here, k q1 times q2 divided by the distance squared, there'll be x squared plus y squared times, and <laughs> I'm just gonna write this down without explanation, x over square root of x squared plus y squared, that's the x component, <laughs> And the y component will be k times q1, q2, divided by x squared plus y squared times uh, y over square root of x squared plus y squared. This is uh, how Coulomb's law appears in Cartesian representation. And I hope you are happy that we will almost uh, never be using that. I think you might see this representation a few times when you are watching me derive electric field of an extended charge distribution using direct integration. You might see me trying to do this a couple times, but uh, I won't expect you to do that because, <laughs> again, it's such an ugly expression that uh, there are better ways to approach um, uh, situations like uh, this. So that's where we introduce a different way of representing vector quantities. We uh, introduce uh, the representation that you will actually see um, CLC use to introduce Coulomb's law and describe Coulomb's law at least as an introductory thing is going to be the polar representation or polar coordinate system. Um, but the polar coordinate system is a little bit difficult to draw, so let me not draw it. Let me just talk about the polar representation of a vector, or polar coordinates, or polar uh, polar parameters. So when you are dealing with the, when you are using polar representation, what you do is you deal with the two parameters instead of x and y components. You deal with the length, the magnitude, and direction. It's like uh, it naturally fits in with how we define vectors, the properties the vector has. So in describing this vector in polar representation, the first quantity you would have is the, the, the distance r uh, from the origin where the tail of the vector is to the tip where the, the, the it indicates the length of the vector. And uh, an angle theta, I guess I already labeled the theta. Um, so this r and theta that might even be called your polar coordinate. And you can kind of imagine how with these two parameters, you can describe any point in this uh, uh, entire two-dimensional plane. If you had a point here, for example, you would have that uh, distance r, r2, and you would have this angle all the way from here to here, theta2. And if uh, you want you to describe a particular point to someone else, you can, um, you know, measure with the ruler and protractor what that uh, length and direction is. And in the polar representation, Coulomb's law looks super um, um, beautiful. In the polar representation, Coulomb's law looks like it's still going to be a vector law because it describes a force. And it'll look like um, the magnitude the length, which will be... Uh, Coulomb constant times product of the charges divided by, let me use the letter R, distance between the source charge and the, the force uh, charge that's filling the force. That would be R squared. And this is the magnitude. I have to turn it into vector. Within the polar representation, there are two unit vectors. Uh, let me kind of take this point and just uh, blow them up uh, here so that I can draw a large picture. The two unit vectors in the polar coordinate system, it looks like this. So I had this uh, radial line coming in. I have a radial unit vector, r hat. It goes in the direction of the r. And uh, we, I, so you, know, you need uh, two orthogonal unit vectors to define a coordinate axis. And your um, second, uh, the unit vector that's perpendicular to this, is your theta hat unit vector. 
And theta head, it kind of goes in the direction that theta increases. So if you had a circle, it's a tangent to the circle and it goes counterclockwise uh, for the two dimensional thing. So uh, with the Coul Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law only points in this direction. So we would say this magnitude in the direction of our head. This is Coulomb's law in polar representation. Much simpler, more beautiful. If we could, we would just stay in polar representation and work everything out using polar representation. Uh, now nah, we can't. <laughs> uh, so there are some scenarios where you do have to actually work with the Cartesian um, uh, uh, Cartesian way of dealing with the things. So without going into too much of a detail, because I do want to finish up kind of describing the coordinate axis and how to relate them, let me just give an example. An example of such a scenario where it's difficult to stay 100% in the polar coordinate system is an example of a dipole, which you will be seeing more of. In an arrangement of charges, you know, positive charge here and a negative charge here, uh, if you, for example, want you to figure out what is the net electric field here, then in order to figure out what's the magnitude of electric field due to the, or what's the influence of the electric field due to the positive charge, and what's the influence of the electric field due to the negative charge, and as you are doing all that, you kind of deal with the, um, deal with the, the, the Cartesian aspect of it, because you have this displacement between the two, charges that are, you know, along one of the axes, kind of set up in a Cartesian way. So let's just go over how you convert between a Cartesian system of coordinates, Cartesian system of parameters, coordinate variables, and the polar system of uh, coordinate variables. So let me um, have this example in mind. So this example here. Of, uh, let me just pick a point. Um, in fact, for uh, sake of a variety, let me pick two points. This is going to be my point one, and this is going to be my point two. And um, you can think of how one might describe it with the Cartesian coordinates. That's the kind of the natural one, x and y. Uh, you could say, oh, x and y, that's my coordinates. And I want to describe its a polar coordinate. And the polar coordinates, I think once you draw the picture, you will begin to see. So for the polar coordinates, what I need is I need this distance here. And I need this angle here. If I have theta and r uh, in terms of x and y, that will give me how to convert to polar coordinates from the Cartesian um, um, parameters. So as you look at it, um, the kind of the thing that I hope you will get into practice of noticing is I want you to notice the right triangles. Because the right triangles will allow you to use your trick knowledge. Uh, reminder of the so ka toa mnemonic that you have learned, which stands for sine is, uh, so sine of an angle is the opposite of our hypotenuse and the uh, ka is uh, cosine of the angle is the adjacent over hypotenuse and toa, the tangent of an angle is the opposite over adjacent. These are the initials that I'm using. Um, so, and the, the angle that it's talking about is always an angle of a right triangle. So I have this right triangle here. So, um, so as I look at it, um, so by knowing my Cartesian coordinates, what I do know is I know the two legs. I know this is x. I know this is x. I know this is y. So I can use a Pythagorean theorem that tells me the hypotenuse. Um, you know, r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Or if I want pop r, which is a positive quantity, then r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. That part, I actually didn't need any trig functions. Uh, the trig functions will be needed for the next part, where I try to figure out, uh, what's my theta? So in order to get, and that's where I know this, oh, my theta occurs in all these functions. So I must be able to use something here to figure out theta. 
good. <laughs> and uh, and actually, you have three different ways to get at it. Um, you could uh, actually, having already figured out the hypotenuse, you could uh, say, all right, um, I have the opposite side, y, so I can say sine theta is y over square root of x squared plus y squared. So my theta would be arc sine of um, y over square root of x squared plus y squared. That's not wrong. Most of the times you will get right answer. Um, I just want to represent uh, the kind of the shortest, the shortest pathway of converting from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates, which would be so. In order to write what I just wrote, you actually kind of had to figure out the hypotenuse first. Uh, and uh, suppose in whatever scenario you are in, you either don't know it or you don't want to figure it out then uh, what you should consider doing is use only the parameters that are directly given to you in the specification of the Cartesian coordinates. Then you could say, hmm, I have this leg here, which is opposite to the angle. I have this leg here, which is adjacent to the angle. Uh, if I use the tangent, then I can, um, I can do that. So if I write the tangent of theta is equal to uh, opposite that would be y, y over x. So you say, um, so uh, to find the angle itself, you apply arc tangent through, and you say theta is equal to arc tangent of y over x. You could almost call this the formula to convert from Cartesian to polar. Now, if I stop there, uh, I'll have told you something that's not 100% correct there's a slight bit of an issue. Not with this step, this step is actually perfectly fine. But this step here, if you get into habit of using that, sometimes you will make mistakes. So let me just point that out. <laughs> I can point that out with this point here. Uh, let me just be concrete with that point. Let me give it some numbers. Its x component is minus five. Its uh, y component is um, a 3. So, um, so you go through this, okay, I want to figure out what is my, uh, the magnitude r. So you say r is equal to um, square root of um, minus 5 squared plus 3 squared. I do not believe I can do that in my head. So let me use a calculator. Uh, uh, minus 5 squared is 5 squared, so I do 5 squared plus 3 squared is that. Take the square root, 5.831. That's my magnitude. Good. And you move on to the next thing. Okay, let's calculate theta, which is going to be the arc tangent of... Uh, uh, let me write it out first and then plug it in. It's going to be arc tangent of minus 5. Wait, no, no, that's not right the y coordinates, that would be 3, 3 divided by x minus 5. Okay, so on my calculator, I have to start with what's uh, in the arc tangent. So 3 divided by 5 minus sign, um, minus 0 0.6, it looks right. Okay, let's do arc tangent, second inverse tangent. And it tells me, okay, minus 30.96 degrees. I think I'm in degree mode. And I hope you can obviously see that when I draw the angle of minus 30.96 degrees, that doesn't give me the direction of um, <laughs> direction of my uh, um, uh, direction of my actual vector, which is uh, going in this direction. Uh, this is something you always have to be careful whenever you are using inverse trig function. It comes down to, because, uh, you know, imagine looking at a plot of uh, a sine of x or cosine of x when, or tangent of x, uh, but tangent looks kind of ugly. So let me just plot up as a function of theta, uh, sine, and uh, let me do cosine in blue. So sine curve looks like this over a theta of 2 pi. From 0 to 2 pi, sine looks like that. Cosine over a period of 0 to 2 pi looks something like this. Oops, uh, wrong color. Cosine is going to be blue. Cosine over a period of 2 pi looks something like this. 
And the problem is, so the, the functions themselves, these are fine. You know, you pick a value of theta, there's going to be a single value that corresponds to whatever the sine of theta is. You pick a value of theta, there's going to be a single value that corresponds to whatever cosine of theta is. Sometimes positive, sometimes negative. The challenge is, imagine trying to do a reverse lookup, where someone gives you the cosine or the sine and asks you for the theta. There's going to be, uh, so for a given value of um, sine theta, for example, there's going to be a multiple theta that meet that condition. There's going to be one theta here that meets that condition. There's going to be another theta here that meets that condition. So when they define the uh, inverse trig function for your calculator, they deliberately limit the range of those inverse trig functions. So for arc sine, the output of arc sine, whatever ratio you put in, it's always going to be between in radians minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Meaning when you use arc sine, the answers you can possibly get are only in this range. Uh, in the language that we use in uh, geometry trick class, either quadrant one or quadrant four. And if you are using arc cosine, that too, and again, the input being some sort of ratio, it's always going to be limited between, I want to say zero and pi. So it's going to be limited between something in the first quadrant or the second quadrant. Um, so, so um, and finally, when uh, you have arc tangent, it'll, for whatever ratio put you put in um, within uh, the, I think with arc tangent, the domain is uh, all the real numbers. Then the smallest value it'll give you is minus pi over two. And the largest value it'll give you is pi over two. So that's why we got this value in degrees it gave me something between zero and minus 90 degrees. That doesn't mean that your actual angle that uh, corresponds with this ratio of y over x is actually in the fourth quadrant. As I, it's drawn here, it might be in the second quadrant. So, um, so as far as converting from Cartesian to polar coordinates go, I prefer to so, you know, not have this final formula because it's a little bit misleading. You might use it, but you have to be careful when you use it. Instead, I prefer to just leave it here. This expression will always be valid. So, you know, when I take the ratio of the y over x, when I take the ratio of 3 over minus oh, wait, 3 over minus 5, that ratio is actually correct. So for that point, if I, uh, uh, so whatever this angle ended up being, um, if I, uh, it is going to be correct that if I calculate tangent of that angle theta that I've drawn there, then that ratio is going to end up being what we calculated here, minus 0 0.6, minus 0 0.6. So that is actually going to be correct. And let me actually demonstrate. So having seen this angle, I actually can figure out what this angle theta will be. That angle theta will be 149.04 degrees. So if I have the angle 149.04 degrees, and if I take the tangent of that, I do get the correct value minus you know, something that's close enough to 0 0.6. Um, and um, so what you have to do here is you have to uh, kind of work out what quadrant, you know, quadrant one, two, three, or four, your vector actually is in, and use that to inform what angle theta your, um, your actual angle will be. Uh, all of this is done much easier by drawing a figure. So, um, so that's how you should do it. And um, converting from polar to Cartesian, Sorry, this took a long time. So I think I'm out of time to do polar to Cartesian. Um, let me, I'll reassess how much of this I want to do in the future. <laughs> um, I'll just give you the formula. So the formula to convert from polar to Cartesian 
that is actually a lot easier and it doesn't have as many uh, caveats associated with it. So with the polar, you, so the assumption is you've been given R and theta. You know the magnitude and the angle. Then the X component, X, uh, um, the, the well, X component should be R cosine theta and Y component should be R sine theta. Um, this kind of, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing I was trying to discourage in my physics for a, you know, automatically associating uh, cosine with the x and sine with the y. Um, but as far as the, the conversion formulas go, yeah, yeah, cosine gives you x, sine gives you y. Because of the way it's defined, the angle theta is defined to be angle from the positive x axis going counterclockwise. So uh, that's the formula, um, and there's uh, less, uh, uh, fewer things you can do wrong with it. And uh, I guess I didn't quite get to 3D. Um, I might find an opportunity to cover 3D coordinate systems, uh, which is the two kinds that you might have seen are the cylindrical coordinate system and the spherical coordinate system. And um, if there's an opportunity in the future, I'll try to cover that. Um,